Good morning. Welcome to the second Advent worship service. We're so glad all of you are here and all of those that join us on YouTube. We're glad they're with us too. Let us pray. Dear Father, may we be ready to receive your word in us today. In and through Jesus, we pray. Amen. Um, I'm going to be reading our first scripture lessons today. The first is from Isaiah 7 through 14, and then I'm going to jump to 9. 7:14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall call him Emmanuel. And 9, I'm going to read verses 1 through 2. But there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulon and the land of Nephtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness on the light has shined. This is the word of the Lord. Okay. The call from God that we will hear in a few moments probably seems just as strange today as it did in first century Palestine in that small town in the middle of nowhere called Nazareth. Co the commentary writer Joel Green tells us that Nazareth of Galilee was an insignificant, despised, and unclean place. And yet, it's where the angel came to visit Mary. Let us listen again to uh, what is, I'm sure, a familiar story. Um, it is Luke... 1, verses 26 through 38. 
In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you... Do not be afraid, Mary. There we go. For you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for who who is said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. May God add his blessing to the hearing and reading of God's holy word. If we were listening closely, which I'm sure you were, we most likely heard echoes from last week's call of John through Zechariah and Elizabeth. There were some similarities. Did you, there was an angel. They were both afraid and troubled, as we would all be. Both were promised sons and given their names that they would be called. They were both told that the children would be great and they each asked the angel a question. But after that, the stories become very different because the first story took place in the temple, the dwelling place of God, and the others was in Nowheresville, Nazareth. Elizabeth was barren and she wanted a child. Mary was a virgin and clearly was not looking to have a baby at this time. That was not in her plan at all. The Holy Spirit would fill John even before he was born but Jesus' own inception, conception was accomplished through the power of the Holy Spirit. Zachariah's question got him nine months of solitude, well, at least silence. <laughs> he may not have been alone, but he was silent. Whereas Mary's question brings the good news about her relative Elizabeth and more. And yet these stories cannot be pulled apart from each other. The call of Mary begins with telling us how far along Elizabeth is in her pregnancy. That's kind of an interesting way to start somebody else's story. And just like the call of John and his ministry, it was also woven into Jesus' ministry. You can't pull those two apart. John's call was mixed up with Jesus. So although it may be more common today for young women, I thought about that. You know, we have more young women having children and then getting married. That seems to be a trend in our society. Um, it's still the strangeness of this, I think, is still strange, don't you, today? I mean, still the story is kind of like, I don't know. Why would God call a young girl who had no parenting experience to, to uh, be the, the mother of God's son? Or why would God call someone who wasn't properly married to be the mother of God's son? And why not wait until Joseph and Mary had tied the knot? I mean, doesn't that seem like it would be the proper time? Maybe this is just a tiny bit unorthodox in our minds, maybe slightly outlandish and hard to believe. I've had people tell me that this part of Scripture is the part that trips them up the most. So might this call of Mary be a test of our faith too? I don't know. I just ask questions. Mary seems, if we look closely at the story and how it starts, Mary doesn't seem to have any, or not any status, actually. Her hometown isn't at all famous, and as according to Joel Green, the commentary writer, it's just not a nice place to go. She's not at all renowned herself. Um, her family doesn't seem to have many honors. We do find out that she's marrying well, though, because Joseph is from the line of David. So she's got a good spouse, so she's going to, but she's not married yet. She's a virgin, thankfully, since she is betrothed. But most of all, we found out, the most important thing we find out is she's the favored one. Or as the children, as Mason and I talk, she's God's favorite. 
And what more could a person ask for than to be told, you're my favorite by God. But for Mary, I, even though that was a wonderful thing, I think it still came as a shock to her. I think when the angel showed up and said, rejoice, O favored one, the Lord is with you, Mary's face and her body language must have said, I'm scared to death, I'm upset, I'm something, because the angel was quick, very quick to tell her to, to not be worried, to not be afraid, and tells her again that she's found favor with God. Now we must remember that in those days, Mary would have been about 12 or 13 years old. And, and she was not like a priestess or a prophetess or anything. It wasn't like she had a fancy church title yet. Actually, she never really started to live as an adult. She was still living in her father and mother's house because she hadn't gone to be with Joseph yet. So she's still living at home. And yet, God, she's found favor with God. So to be favored, if we're going to get down to what the Greek says, um, it's a passive verb, and it means, it's, it's said, the word is, it's um, passive tense, and it's karitoa, karitoa, which can be defined as uh, pursued with grace, compassed with favor, to be honored with blessings, all of this done without Mary even asking for it, because it's a passive tense. That means God did it. It wasn't from Mary. It wasn't Mary's doing. And now after all she's heard, Mary's question isn't whether this will happen, but how will this happen since she is a virgin? Now I think it's fairly amazing that she came up with that question because I think if I was toe-to-toe -to -toe with an archangel, I'm not sure I would have the presence of mind to ask a question at all. So I'm, I'm very impressed. But as we know, how you ask a question sometimes expresses the true meaning or your attitude behind the question. Mary's question of how can this be since my virgin was way different. It was more like a process question. Whereas Zechariah's question is, how can this be so, was kind of saying, is this really true? Big difference. Mary's question came out of a place of trust while well, Zechariah's came sort of from a place of skepticism or even disbelief. He was having a hard time with the angel's news to him. And Mary, having asked this question, received a whole bunch more information. I mean, it was the, the rest of the, what she needed to know was given to her, that the Holy Spirit would come upon her, the power of the Most High would overshadow her, and the child would be holy. He told her the good news about her, her relative Elizabeth, who was also expecting, and that was followed up with that wonderful line of, for nothing will be impossible with God. I mean, I was really glad she asked the question so she could find out all that information. Mary, who has barely begun to live and realize, you know, what life's about, does something amazing. She accepts her favored status with quiet strength and humility. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Now, I believe Mary was human like all of us, so I have to believe she had plenty of questions. What would her betrothed say? What would her family say? What would her community say? What, what would happen? And so if we read ahead just a smidgen in the story, we find out, that um, Mary heads to see the one person who can understand her situation, and that's Elizabeth. So she now knows that Elizabeth is in a similar status, so she makes haste and she goes. And it doesn't say anything about Zechariah, I'm sorry to say, guys. He's not even mentioned, you know, right there that, he, um, that Mary even talked to Zechariah. But I kind of think it was one of those times when Mary needed to talk to Elizabeth, and I think Elizabeth needed to talk to Mary. Those two women, she had many things in common that they needed to discuss. Well, what does Mary's call to be the mother of our Lord have to do with us? I mean, that's a kind of unusual call story. What does that have to do with us? And what about the Holy Spirit in us? That's, that's a very unusual thing, too, how the Holy Spirit works in that situation. And, and what about this favoritism? And how do we tie that into this being the Sunday about peace? Okay, I'm going to try and accomplish that in the next few minutes. The angel told Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Some people have been troubled by these words and wondered what they meant. Yet it's interesting, these exact same Greek words were used by Jesus to describe the Holy Spirit coming upon the disciples. 
In Acts 1.8, we read, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. I saw a wonderful quote this last week or so by a Dr. Carolyn Moore. She was preaching at Asbury Theological Seminary in Kentucky. She said, you are not being sent out of this place with an eyedropper full of the Holy Spirit. You are being sent out with the power and authority to cast out demons, cure diseases, proclaim the kingdom, and heal the sick. You see, the same, this Holy Spirit may not produce a baby in us like it did Mary. That, that probably is not gonna happen. But surely our call to be disciples is bound up with the Holy Spirit coming upon us as it did those disciples and as it did Mary. You see, we were never meant to live our lives deficient in Holy Spirit. You know how you can't be deficient in vitamins? Well, we're not to be deficient in the Holy Spirit. We need our daily dose of Holy Spirit, not just an eyedropper full. Much has been, then there's Mary's favored status. Much has been made of the fa Mary's favored status. In some churches, Mary's favored status seems to outweigh other statuses in the church. But isn't it interesting that when I was studying favor, I found this verse in Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. And it was like the light went on because Paul uses the exact same word as he talks to the people of Ephesus. He says this in Ephesians 1, 1 through 6. You can check it out in your own Bible and see if I'm correct. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love, he destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. I know you are wondering, I never said the word favor in that passage. Actually, the phrase the freely bestowed on us is another um, translation of the word karatoa. So his favor is freely bestowed on us because of or in the beloved. That's Jesus. Paul reiterates the same thought. Actually, if you read that passage over, you will see that he's saying the same thing over and over in that passage. We're blessed in Christ. We have every spiritual blessing in Christ. We're chosen in Christ before we ever were made. We're destined in Christ and freely bestowed all of this in us in Christ. Long before we ever loved God or loved Jesus, before we could ever pray and ask, God chose us to be God's favorites. God planned to favor us in Christ. And just like I tell my children, so it is with God. Each of you is God's favorite. Well, here's where it gets interesting. We have choices to make like Mary did. Our choice have to do with peace because peace with God does not always translate into peace on earth or peacefulness with our families or peacefulness in this life. Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace but a sword because he knew what would happen when people chose him in their lives. When we choose for Christ, sometimes other people take exception to that. God's time and God's will can look strange to others. Mary's call to be a mother as a virgin would not necessarily bring her a peaceful existence with others in her own community. They were going to look down on her. She was going to get a lot of grief for that choice that she listened to God. And certainly her life was chaotic as she watched her son be ridiculed, be arrested, and die. So where was the peace for the one who carried the Prince of Peace? But Mary chose to be at peace with God over being at peace with her parents, with her betrothed, or with her community. For her to be favored by God meant she needed to show God favor. So that meant trusting and believing God's great love for her and this tiny promised baby, who was, by the way, God's only begotten son, would be enough that this baby would change not only her world, but the whole world, that all might know this favor 
and love and what peace with God can mean. Let's pray. Loving God, how is it that before this world was ever created, that you had a plan to offer us peace with you through Jesus? God, how can we be more like Mary, trusting your love and the call you make on our lives so that we too might believe we are your favorites? And as your favorite ones, Lord God, how can we then choose to be at peace with you this day, first and foremost, to accept your love and favor in Jesus so that we we can then follow him out of this place today and into that difficult, sometimes dark and sometimes very violent world that you love. But it often threatens our peacefulness. It threatens us when we read the news, we feel threatened. When we read the newspaper, we feel threatened. And sometimes just being in our communities. How, Lord, can we take your love out there? How do we share that love with others that we meet? So they might know they are favored too in and through Jesus. And Lord, as we sit here in prayer together, we await your Holy Spirit, who we desperately need, desperately need to have come upon us and overshadow us and lead us to know for certain that nothing will be impossible with you. Oh, Lord God, we... We pray this, and we believe you for it. Even impossible things like we prayed, like our government working together and, and all lives mattering and, and the church quietly and gently and humbly leading in this world. We believe you for that. And so in that faithfulness, we are going to believe you for other prayers, Lord. People who we know are in need this day. Even our neighbor, Gary Siglin, the pastor of the Methodist Church, just right there, Lord. We lift him to you today as he's recovering from um, cancer surgery that he had this week. Lord, we pray for him and, and for your grace and your healing grace over his body, believing you, Lord, that, that you, have the, you give and have the power to heal. But Lord, we also believe for his family, for his wife and his his extended family into his church and his children, that you would be with them during this time of recovery. We know that can sometimes be a long recovery, but Lord, we believe you are with him this morning. And Lord, we, we think a little further out to Christians, other Christians in our, the Christian churches in our area, Lord, but Christians all over this world, that this Christmas time are celebrating the birth of your son and that Jesus is coming again, but in places as we talked this morning in our class, that's not a welcome celebration. So Lord God, we lift those folks up that indeed they might be celebrating with joy but finding new ways to share your love in places where that can mean their lives. Lord, we, we think today of the people of Ethiopia where they've had unrest in that country. And we think of the Christian churches there that that um, what that means to continue to love those who are causing the unrest and those who aren't. How do you do that? Lord, we thank you for you are there with them and your love surrounds them. Lord, we also think of some folks that that came to me this this week that need prayer. Thelma, a woman who has just found out she has cancer in both her lungs, and Dennis, who has pneumonia in both his lungs, and a woman, Kim, who is pregnant with her second child and found out she has melanoma cancer. Lord God, I lift each of these three to you, Thelma, Dennis, and Kim, for your amazing healing grace. I thank you, Lord, that you make a way when there is no way. And Lord, you are indeed our healer, and you are their healer. Lord, we pray for those that are are on our list this morning who um, we've been praying for for a while, and especially those, Lord, who are still in need of your comfort as they struggle with the 
with their loved ones having been gone from this life, but they still live here. Thank you, Lord, for what you want to birth in us in this season. And we look forward to seeing your Holy Spirit at work. We pray all this in and through Jesus, who taught us to praise, praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Let us joyfully sing our final hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. I want you all to sound like angels this morning, all right? Well, I challenge you this day and this week to remember your favorite. You are God's favorite. And as his favorite one, you're invited into his peace in Christ. And then the challenge comes to go out and share that love of the favored one with those who don't know their favorite. We do this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.